I know we we have been like you know doing a lot of sessions on deep learning for the past couple of months. We are taking to the next notch now. Uh, the ones what you saw last year in 2017 are almost the intro level, but these are like you know fairly advanced uh, uh, certain things. Probably certain things may go over your head uh, when I'm talking. I mean, like if your questions stop me then and there, or like you, know, you can talk to me after. Uh, uh, so, uh, and guys on the phone, I mean, like just ping me, um, reachable, or send, shoot me an email, I'll respond back. Okay, or call me. Um, whatever, right. So you know uh, this particular thing. You know why I am. So I'm not going to go through this. So this particular talk, talk, particular topic, right? I'm fairly. Um, uh, it, it's a, it's not a big thing from a deep learning perspective. But the impact of it is very, very huge, right? Uh, this is a research paper which was published uh, last month. Okay, it's a it's a 60-page research paper. I have the paper right here, with along with the notes what it took, right? It's a 60-page research paper which I had to like go through to actually do this particular talk. Um, so, anything with uh, uh, systems, right? Information retrieval is a key. How do you do fast inter information retrieval? Does actually anybody know what index is? Index. Yeah. 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 Pointer to yeah. Okay. So ideally, the concept of index is borrowed from books, right? Why do we use uh, when we look at the back of a book? There's an index. What does it really mean? I mean, like now you have things listed in an alphabetical order on a particular word and where it can be found in the book. That's a literal concept that is translated over to database management systems as an uh, uh, index, right? The index are a key for uh, retrieving uh, anything. So there are a lot of different flavors of index. There's a B3 index, index. there's a hash index, there's a bitmap uh, index. Okay? So when I'm talking about B3 index, it's nothing but like a tree, what you see here, right? Um, so. You have your root node, then you have branch node, then you have your leak node, then the actual physical is what we have to your data is present. So it's balanced. I mean, like, you know, ideally I'd like my B3 to look like this, but in reality it doesn't look like this way, right? Uh, so 1 to 40 or whatever, like, you know, then the left side will have 1 to 20, it's divided that way. So you can actually reach a certain point in that, like, a less number of hops. So it's a, it's a very optimal way to search something or whatever, right? To reach a particular point. That's what B3 index is. Hash. Hash is a fairly different way to actually look up something. Um, think of this way, right? It's a random way to access something. I'm going to give you a, a, a number, right? Like, and I'm going to pass it through a function. It's going to tell. It's going to tell me exactly where this particular record is located. So think of it this way, right? I'm going to take Manish as an example here. I'm going to tell, like, you know, Manish is an index for hash index for CSAA currently. I'm going to tell him, like, ask him a question on, like, you know, where Varun is. Are you exactly able to exactly tell where Varun is currently, right? So, uh, but if there are two Varuns, there's going to be a clash, yeah. right? I'm so that is what hash index has a collision. That's a concept called collision in hash index. In that sense, in that particular term, you can see it here. It's actually linked this way. They use a linked list or something to resolve hashes. The less of the hash it is, faster the access uh, it is. So there's a hash index, right? Um, uh, then there's bitmap index. Bitmap index is pretty much used to design whether a particular row is even present or particular uh, record is present in, in the database or not. So it's similar to a boom filter. Right? I'll talk about that. Um, so what are the cons for a uh, index? Any any cons apart from what I've listed here? Oh, cost of creation, right? Okay, then you have to rebuild. Okay, then if the data is very huge, it can actually backfire. Okay, so cool. Then what 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 are the other other things? Maintain the index. Okay, yeah. everything goes like the same. The cost of creation and maintaining. Right? Yeah, uh, okay, okay. What what else? Not ideal for uh, large scans. Like if you had to get nine out of ten records from a database. Actually, you end up paying more to look up nine things than to just go through the index. So, but these are good cons, right? Obvious cons. I'm being listed here. I have a different reason for why I listed these cons here. All indexes almost assume that it's it's going to model after a worst case distribution of data. Okay. When we are modeling something after worst case distribution of data, we are not taking advantage of what is the obvious pattern in the data. So it is not something which is targeting towards, right? So uh, let's take an example here, right? I have a query of pixel length records with continuous integer keys, right? One to one million. Okay. If I want to use something to store on this one, I would not use a B tree. I would just use an offset to actually store it directly. I can retrieve it. So rather than me having a big O of login to retrieve, I'll get to the asymptotic notation in a little bit. So um, so this 
ஒரே So do you know who is this? Who is this? Not you. <laughs> we are yeah. using a negative. The math would just that. So this is, how many of you actually use uh, the tools, right? We talked about it before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so how many of you actually know about MapReduce? Okay. So this is the guy who wrote the paper on MapReduce. This is Jeff Dean. So anything that comes, he is a senior fellow at Google. Uh, anything that comes from his group is uh, extremely good. And he leads Google Brain. Obviously, he has a large, large number of team of researchers reporting under him. Uh, but whenever he publishes a paper himself, it's really, really good uh, work, right? And this particular paper on learned index came from him. So he has this tendency of looking things a little differently. Okay. When we look at MapReduce, what is the biggest difference between distributed computing has been there for ages. What is the difference between that and MapReduce? In simplified distributed. So in distributed computing, the traditional distributed computing, what was happening is you have the process, you have data stores everywhere, you ship yeah. the data to where the process is. Yeah, right. right. So in this case, um, the process. Yeah. Right. In case of MapReduce, what he did is like you know what? Let me look at it the other way. I'm going to ship the process to where the data is. Okay. So. the map part of it works that way right it became extremely fast in execution due to that reason so that is one of the seminal work that paper i mean if you have read the paper do read the paper that's what spawn hadoo that's what spawn on the data industry whatever right uh, so that paper came from him so very very seminal paper and he always has a tendency to look at things very differently that's what he is doing with indexes currently if this idea takes off it's going to shake how they want to do Great information retrieval in the future. <laughs> it's still a highly research area. Paper came out only last month, so there's not a lot of talks or anything on it yet. Uh, the few comments here and there. So probably this is one of the first talks we're going to see around this particular topic. So, Jeffy. Yeah. So uh, his idea is again. I just had like the mapper news and Jeffy along with few other people to pay. So Jeff Dean, along with a few others, actually released a paper on uh, Learn Index, right? Um, I should actually list down the authors, but I didn't have time. Yeah, and he is not even the last author on this particular paper, so that's fairly important. Which means he has huge contribution on this particular uh, paper. Which means like first author gets a higher contribution. Some people they actually specifically say this is all equal contribution. When you add your name as the last author in a particular paper, that means that you advise that particular team. You didn't actually do a lot of. Okay, that's what it really means. But in this case, he is not the last author. So it's, it's it's a lot of his work. I guess came from him. Yeah. So this thing is: can an index be learned? That is where it's going. Can we actually learn an index? So what does a B three index actually give you? Pointers to the. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's one. Right. Um, so. when you look at it right uh, b3 indexes are nothing but a model when i say a model a predictive model or an inference whatever we are trying to run right so let's say a key is an input that's what it does right in case of b3 it takes key as an input and then what it does it gives a position with a negative and a positive with a page size wherever things are right in case of learned index if you look there Yes, it takes a key as an input. You see, this position as an input, so it can be actually replaced with a learned methodology, right? Where you can actually force it to learn. So far, that very, very, very good question, right? Um, the, they've actually addressed that. Uh, so the biggest problem with uh, models is a semantic guarantee. I'm actually talking about in the next slide. All right. So, so uh, 
I think it's going to rain tomorrow. Maybe not. Okay. So, uh, so that is regression. How much is going to rain? So what it really does is it takes E as an input. It predicts the position of a particular data record. So that's what it does, right? It can be easily replaced with a learned model, like neural network, which is deep learning. So, or the CPUs, current CPUs actually haven't <coughs> think uh, right? The high cost of a particular neural network is going to be the future. You know, Rajiv used to sit at the corner, right? <laughs> <laughs> so we actually was able to move Rajiv from that point to somewhere in the middle. Uh, what, we, we, do, we, we do have a like lot of GPU machines now for computing. Um, so computing itself is changing, right? That's another reason why this paper is actually very, uh, uh, very cool. It's actually hinging on the fact that GPUs are going to give better performance than CPU for indexes yeah? or retrieve uh, record, which is a big deal. Um, um, so the, their thing is GPU performance will increase uh, 1000x by uh, 2025. Moore's law is going to be dead by that time for CPU. Okay, only so much improvement can be done on a CPU. So that's what they're uh, hinging on. So talk about B3, right? B3, you have like a range index, right? What is the range index when you run a query? Let's say like you know anybody who's less than let's say in this room who's like you know less than 30 and uh, greater than 20 years old, probably not much here, I guess. So uh, less than 30 and greater than 20, I want to get that. That's a range index, right? So range query, so range index, you can actually build an index for things of that nature. Um, uh, have like, so, so what the B3, right? Again, as I said, is nothing but a regression model, which is going to give you a position with a good min max error rate, right? Where can you really find it? If I can't find it, how many iterations do I have to, how cycles I need to do to get to the next uh, uh, thing? Uh, any questions? No? Okay. So B3 works as a range, or does it really? actually directly point to You can have a point, you can have a point lookup, or you can have a range. You can have do both, right? Uh, so they have a bounded cost for uh, inserts and lookups. That's one of the obvious advantage of a B3. Um, the, that's one, the people think that's a drawback for neural network, but they have addressed that fact uh, here. So let's actually think about this particular uh, aspect, right? Um, what is the model complexity that we can afford? From a, a BT perspective, so if you look at that, if you looked at the first diagram, whatever I pulled, right? Like you know, I had one to forty as a BT index. This particular thing, one to forty as a BT index, and like you know, two uh, nodes which is splitting. So the access point, right, is like is going down. The access cost is going down, right? So how do we actually traverse uh, a node uh, if we have a page size of one hundred? Page size is like you know, how many records are you going to store in every page? Okay. That's the way it works. So a page size of 100 means I have precision gain of 1 by 100 every node. Let's say if I'm going to start with 100 million rows for me to access, the first thing I'll be able to get down to the point of 1 million, right? Which I have to look up. From 1 million, I'll get up to 10K in the next one. From 10K, I'll get into the next, like I'll just keep going down that way, right? So approximately it takes me 50 cycles to get or traverse a single page. In the PC, that's what it really takes, right? And there may be some page miss and all those things, cache hit miss. There are other factors which will come into picture, but 50 cycles is what we are looking at. So, uh, what, if you look at it, right? Uh, the latest NVIDIA Tesla V100 GPU is actually able to achieve 120 teraflops of operation per second. That's huge. That's huge, right? Which is approximately, if you take it, 60,000 operations per cycle. It's a big deal from a compute perspective. But that, that's why when I'm saying like computer changing, we went through a huge shift when uh, um, in 2012 with like you know, Hadoop coming into picture with traditional distributed computing, which was a data and bandwidth was a bottleneck. It changed for a lot better from Hadoop. Part of all, like you know, we are able to run a lot of analytics job a little faster. But now it's getting to the, even the next level where like you know, people started using GPUs for computing. Six thousand per cycle. Per second, per cycle, define the operation. Operation, there is so many operations can can do in one one attempt. One attempt. So it's, it's it's fairly fast. Okay. So I'm gonna actually ask maybe Jeff to explain cumulative distribution function. CDF. 
So if you have a probability distribution, you know, you have something that tells you how likely things are. And, um, you know, in this case, what take the x axis as a number. So he's talking about ranges. So those are indexes in this case, right? So if you have a probability distribution, you have, you know, this one's so likely, this one's so likely. Cumulative uh, distribution is just adding all those up. So, um, so if you put it this way, right, I'm going to knock on a door, right? Um, I'm going to de define that uh, particular thing where I'm going to find someone who's lesser than 180 pounds as 0.8, okay? That is the probability I'm saying, like, if I knock on 100 doors, that's what I'm going to really get. So it's a very layman uh, kind of example, but you keep adding it up. So, if I'm so yeah, so if you say there are 100 doors, you want to know, um, you know, you're looking for record A, the record that you're looking up in this index, index. is behind one of those doors. You know, if, you're, if you start at one and go up to 100, you're going to add the probability at each one, right? So, you know, you, if you talk about door 60, you say, ah, well, there's this sum of probability that I reach him by the time I got through door 60. So that's a cumulative distribution function. Yeah. So that's what it does. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the mathematical explanation. Uh, but that that's the actual function, right? Can I uh, express range index as a cumulative distribution <coughs> function? That's what they're addressing. So nothing but that's a position estimate what I have to get. That's what every index is supposed to do, give you a position estimate. I have the P, but how am I going to model P as a function of key, right, F of key, into an estimated cumulative distribution function, the total number of keys that I'm going to get. That is the formula what they're trying to model, okay? So let's look at a learned model, right? Yeah, I presented a very glorified picture saying that, you know what, like, you know, CPUs are going to die and only GPUs are going to dominate. But there are obviously practical problems with a lot of those things, right? Uh, they have actually been through a practical problem. They have addressed how they have actually addressed it. So they, the first thing was they modeled this uh, after this 200 million web server log records, uh, in which uh, the timestamp for what they have tried to, to do is the timestamp is uh, x. That, so in any predictive model you're trying to do, you'll have an x and y. Y is your target. Uh, x is your uh, independent variables. So you're going to model using that. So x in this case is timestamp. Y is position. So what they've done is uh, taking a two-layer uh, feed-forward neural network. The standard stuff, remember the first talk what I gave here was building your own uh, neural network with NumPy. So that's what feed forward neural network is. They did it with 32 uh, neurons or hidden uh, neurons per layer. Uh, they just had like a two hidden layer. So what happened is uh, Python plus TensorFlow uh, took like, you know, did about uh, approximately 1250 uh, predictions per second. So what it really means is it took 80,000 nanoseconds to execute the model. Which is high when compared to the B3 traversal for the same data took only 300 nanoseconds. So is it that glorified? It doesn't appear faster, right? Okay. Let's see how the TensorFlow. TensorFlow is um, a package from Google, mm -hmm. an open source package from Google. Uh, uh, we used to build deep learning models. So the work what you did on the tagging. Uh, that data, we're going to take that, we're going to actually use TensorFlow to model it. So okay. that's where this feeds into it. Okay. So why is learn index so in this particular case? So TensorFlow, again, right, I've done an awesome job with designing and all those stuff, but it is designed for running in Google. So there are certain gotchas you can actually obviously see. One, right, uh, the certain things are kept global in nature. So one reason I found out, okay, so this, it has a significant invocation overhead. That is what we are dealing with. Every time you have to load the model to do a prediction, we are dealing with something like that. So neural network, um, so the, what is the next thing, right? Um, next thing is getting the prediction level from 1,000 to 100 is an issue. Let's say I want 1 million, okay? Uh, um, I have 1 million rows, records, right? I want to see the thing about indexes is it can, it's not only tells you where things are, it's actually able to retrieve you fairly fast with a guarantee. You can't have one neural network. This is where the other thing comes into picture, right? What you asked, Manish. Um, you can't have one neural network model or one deep learning model to actually solve the thing end to end, yeah. right? It just, you have to then fine tune it to such a level of accuracy, it's going to overfit. It's not going to perform that well. So, getting to the last mile of uh, the difference between, uh, it's a difference between Usain Bolt and the guy who finished things. Let me put it that way, simply, right? 
So we use it more. You are very different. I mean, like now you build differently. Your mindset works very differently. But the guy who finished second is still good, but it's not Usain Bolt, right? That's not whom you think of when it comes to running. So that's what it is. So the ML optimization uh, goal is to minimize an average error, right? It's not only to identify them, but also fetch it with the same uh, error rate. So uh, fetch it with min max error. Uh, so the other aspect is this comes to the fact that. We are dealing with matrix multiplication underneath. We are in the first session, you will know. So neural networks need all ways to be loaded into memory for it to perform a compute rather than B3. B3, you can actually have extremely catch efficient performance and uh, all those things. So that, that's where, um, <coughs> that's one reason why learn index is stored in this case. So what did they do uh, to fix it? So what they did is like now, they did the model training using TensorFlow, but for inference, they said, like, heck with TensorFlow, I'm not going to use it. It's obviously slow, right? With a Python as an interface, it gets translated to C++ underneath, and then it gets executed on the GPU or wherever it is, right? Uh, so infill does not happen using TensorFlow. What they did is they actually took the weights and model. You can actually extract. All it really learns underneath is weights, right? You have an architecture. They took both, and they actually rewrote that particular thing in C++ to get a faster uh, execution uh, time. Uh, I mean, they actually modeled it after Spark uh, 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 process, uh, so where they actually cut down the significant runtime execution, the invocation overhead and runtime execution to start with. So they modeled it after that. So the simple models actually ran an order of 30 nanoseconds. This was 300, that was 30. They were able to cut it down to that, that level. Uh, so that's a performance improvement, right? That's why when I said the paper is good, they put through a lot of effort, time and effort to actually think through a lot of these dodges and improve it. Uh, it's not like if, they, if this paper takes off, this research idea gets implemented in a lot of places, it's going to be a big deal from uh, retrieval. Okay. Going back to the last mile accuracy question, right? One model cannot learn everything, obviously, right? I, I'm, not, I'm not going to fine tune every aspect of it to a level where, like, you know, I'm going to make it memorize everything. That's not a good model to deal with. It has an obvious thing where I have to deal with inserts and lookups later. Inserts and upends, right? I have to look at that later. So it's not a good design uh, philosophy to do that. Rather than that, can I have a recursive model in there? What I mean that is, rather than me trying to solve everything at one shot, let me actually build multiple small models. Stage one, I have a model which is going to give me a prediction of, think of like a triaging process. Okay? So first call comes to Alex here, right? Uh, uh, she receives an inbound call from some big customer who wants to do business with us. Let's put it that way. And it comes to her. So what she'll do, I mean, she'll ask, like, you know, she'll find out what kind of customers they are and all those things, then probably look for one of the partners or redirect it to uh, Rajiv, right? Comes to Rajiv. Rajiv will probably know more, like, you know, he'll probably reach out to Manish or Benzi or Nimish or whoever that is, right? To redirect to the, the right kind of customers or Muli, right? So, so this is like a triaging process, right? You make the learning to be that way too. So what it happens is, let's say in this case, right, I'm building a stage <coughs> model. This stage model, just gives me what other model I need to use. Okay, so this is not a tree, still. Okay, so it just gives me what is the other model that I have to use. It goes here in this case, right? And this tells me what other model I have to use, and which in turn gives me the position. So tuning on a smaller model to get a higher level of accuracy is a lot easier compared to trying to solve that problem from that far away. That's what it is. But also, these models are existing, or it is automatically generated. It's actually they wrote a framework to actually build it on the data. Right. And so it's easy to reach to the position. Exactly. Model. Last mile accuracy. Yeah. It's like me trying to find the location probably in Pune from here. Not going to work, right? I have to land in Pune. <laughs> probably I have to ask someone uh, there. Then it becomes a lot easier. I have to get to India, then Pune, then that's the same analogy. What you can actually do. This one also helps when you're having new records which need to update. Exactly. Yes. New things that you yes. Need to yes. 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 So they have actually handled that even better. I'll get to the next one. So. Uh, we talked about last mile accuracy is a new network or deep learning is an issue, right? The recursive model index actually solves that particular problem. <laughs> the min max error uh, is in the order of hundreds, right? Uh, in the order of hundreds from 100 million records, it's extremely hard. That's why that's I said, right? Like, I'm getting an accuracy level of 99.98% using uh, deep learning is like super hard. That's the difference between Usain Bolt and the next guy. So, uh, so it doesn't happen that often. So, uh, unless until your hyperparameters are really, really good. Okay, so we'll talk about that a little later. But so that's what it is, right? So reducing the error to 10k from 100 million is actually easier. Okay, and uh, then from 10k to 100 is actually easier problem to solve. So chunk it out, uh, modularize in such a way 
that you can actually solve the problem. That's what this recursive model index actually does. Any questions so far? I see a lot of puzzle look, puzzle look in the room. Okay. So, all right. So, it's a hierarchy of model. All right. It is not a tree. It's a hierarchy of model. Each model takes a key as an input and tells you what is the next model. Right. That's all it is. The process is repeated till you reach, reach the last stage. So, uh, again, that's what I said, right? Because the models are not trees. It is possible for different models to pick the same model underneath. Right? You may learn it better. So, uh, each model does not necessarily cover the same amount of records. B3, you have like a page size and you have to deal with certain things. Like I said, 100 is my page size. I said 100 million to uh, 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 10K, 10K to uh, 100, 100 to this what you think. That's the way I'm dealing with it. Right? In this case, it's fairly easy. It's not like, you know, it does not have the same amount of record. You can tune it to whichever level you want and whatever. Right? Uh, so that is one thing. So it should not be, so that's what I said, right? It's not, um, it should not be, uh, the first stage, it should not be uh, taught as like, you know, giving you a position estimate. It's rather saying like which expert you have to talk to at the next level. That is all it's really saying. It's a triaging process on how to reach uh, the particular point. So what are the advantages of actually using recursive model index? So it's easy to learn the overall shape of a data distribution, right? And you can actually tune it to the lower level, last mile uh, accuracy. Um, so what it really does is it divides the space into smaller sub, sub uh, ranges, similar to a B tree or a decision tree. So there is a fundamental change in how uh, they they are looking at this particular thing. So and there is no search process involved. If you look at B tree, what is the cost involved? That's a search. This is not a search. I'm giving a model. I'm getting the next one. I'm giving that input to the next one. I'm getting the next output. Right? Which model I have to talk to? It is not a search. Search is very tedious. Okay. So this one is not a search. So, and uh, we look at it, we are looking at a CPU for uh, uh, execution uh, before, but when you start thinking of DPUs or GPUs for execution, this becomes a lot, it makes a lot more sense for us to actually go this way. Uh, when you have a, a you have to load, how to do matrix, it's actually kind of do, it will be extremely fast. So, ideally, right, if you use GPUs for doing this, the computation, the time complexity for this is not big of login, it's big of one. That's what we are dealing with, it's instantaneous. Okay, so we're talking about recursive model index, right? You know what, not in all cases, B3s are good in certain cases, right? Why can't we leverage that too? So once they thought about doing it, it's like, you know, they have the recursive model index. They thought, you know, B3s are also good in some cases. So if it is not hitting a certain threshold of uh, 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 output or like you know, an error rate, if it has to fall within certain threshold of error rate, if it doesn't hit that, can that be replaced by a B3? So it's a combination of a B tree and a neural network model that they have come up into a picture, right? So the way it works is the top layer would be a, a small neural net, okay? But okay, to be able to uh, learn a wide range of complex data distributions. Um, the models at the bottom and model uh, hierarchy would be uh, simple models, right? It may be even, it may not be even a uh, neural network. It can be a linear regression model. And y equal mx plus b, the value of n, that's what you learn. That, that is linear regression. <coughs> so you can actually use it to do that. I mean, it's going to be, that's fairly easy to compute uh, compared to neural network. So you want, it's, it's going to be faster in execution. Right? You just you can make a call. Um, and you can actually use b, b trees at the bottom uh, stage if the data is particularly hard to learn. I mean, there's no way to learn a particular pattern, right? Why to push, uh, may make a neural network to force it to learn? Uh, it's going to take a long time and it's not going to give you the accuracy what you want. Or you have already come to a level where you can actually use B3 to make things run even faster. It's a hybrid. It's the best of both worlds, right? You use one for the reason for the for what it is meant to. That is what this particular thing is. So uh, it, it also helps us to bond the worst case performance of learned index to the performance of B3s. So what it means is. What is the worst case performance of a B3 before? Log in. Right? So the worst case performance for this particular thing also will be log in, in case you're not able to learn anything at all. Right? Um, so, so in some cases where it's not possible to learn a pattern at all, it may be completely B3s. So that way, right? You mean, uh, it's like the analogy what I say sometimes, you, know, you can't take a, a tank to a knife battle. Right? If uh, Neural network doesn't work for learning the pattern for your learning indexes. Let's not do that. Let's actually use B3, which should work. We have to solve the problem in an effective way. 
uh, for this particular thing. So that is the, the algorithm for, for it. I'll send you a link for the paper. It's pretty much the same. What they're really uh, doing is, if you look at it, the absolute error for this particular thing here, if it is above a threshold, uh, threshold then they actually train a B tree. If it is below a threshold, certain threshold, they, they actually use a uh, neural network. So that can be defined. Any questions so far? Uh, jumping, maybe I'm jumping ahead a little bit. But what is the cost of computation here? I mean, you can always, <coughs> uh, ultimately, the goal is to make it faster, right? Yeah. But is having multiple, let's say, get one time computation higher thing. Um, if you have to load things into a CPU, yes, right? When you say cost of computation is higher, obviously it's more operation that has to be performed. But we can't look at it from a traditional angle on this particular thing. Okay. Uh, GPUs actually give you the performance, and this is pretty much, right, like, how many cores does a CPU have? Uh, right, 16, 16, uh, 8, 16, all of them. Uh, walk into that particular little thing where I read uh, where Raji used to sit, right? Yeah. <laughs> 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 so walk into that particular. You see a GPU card out one machine which has like you can actually see a GPU card that has four thousand cores in it. Okay, so even though the cost of computation may all appear a little higher, but the the, the procurement cost, the the mission ex is inexpensive. So you will be able, able to actually do a lot more with that. Uh, uh, price no, isn't that true for so if I have to do Apple Swap, if I say put a weekly on GPU, you know, the, the on the GPU won't work. Right? No, no, but even even to that point, uh, maybe maybe uh, just playing that back, right? Yeah. Uh, because this can maybe put the whole thing in con uh, in context. Yeah, because yeah. Well, I mean, ultimately, you have to in our mind, you have to say why. Why? Yeah. yeah right? so the, the thing is that uh, physical access is infinitely more expensive. Then uh, 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 a clock yeah. computing, right? Yeah. So the point is that if I could come and if my uh, a traffic cop, if you will, is is very structured, like we have moved even in our um, uh, signal signals here uh, based on sensing of the cars and stuff. Let's say it was not that way before, right? It was two minutes this way, then then thirty seconds this way, and stuff like that. Why is this more efficient? Because it takes more intelligence into consideration. Now, it doesn't have predictive analytics right now where it says, oh, I'm expecting it's 5 o'clock, this traffic is going to increase. Now, it's almost like that, that the more computational you can do, the physical access is very expensive. Yeah. So in B3, I have to still go through X number of pages to get to where I want to go to, right? If I had a hash function, which takes me directly to there. No, but, but I can load that. Memory cost is so cheap today. I can load all that. No, memory is different from yeah. physical access. And I think data and keep multiplying, that's too. It, actually, it's a cost computation. Yeah. If you believe that you can get that whole B3 and, 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 and uh, to, uh, uh, to, to memory and, uh, and do that, <clears throat> there is a cost of loading that B3. Okay, that's a physical access. Ultimately, if you had a way where you had to access 50 pages or 60 pages or 30 pages to get to an answer versus a hash function, which takes you there, great. Yeah. Now, better than hash function is a model. Model says, I'm going to direct you somewhere. Better than one model is multiple model where it takes you from you know global point of view to a uh, continent, to a country, to a city, and each one has its own level of accuracy, which it can do. It's really boiling down to that traffic of that, that yeah, thing which points you. Yeah. I think one of the things also is B3 is scalability always going to be a question. In this case, I think you can scale it to humongous numbers and then basically still be Yes, to, right? Um, large volume, it will scale fairly well. Again, if you have a GPU, that's when like, the difference will start really coming in. Right. You redirect access to that particular single unit or multiple units, whatever it is. You pretty much get where things are stored. Yeah. Right? It's going to be instantaneous rather than like no bigger log in from a time complexity perspective. That is the big, big, big difference that it's going to bring. It's instantaneous access. So essentially, you are giving a hash like performance yeah. with a learned index. Learn yeah. Right? Yeah. And the way I think of learned index, at least in my head, is the going into, let's say, you were to direct me uh, how a particular file is kept on your desk. And especially, it works in my case because it's all mass, right? <laughs> so I'll have to tell you. Then, oh, that thing, okay. Uh, most probably look at box number three under my desk and, and you'll find it there. If this was not 
learn. That is, I have a knowledge that I'm applying because I learned from the, because I, I will put it, but point is that uh, if you want to use some systematic approach, it will take long. It'll take long. And, and each okay. exercise is expensive because you have to pull the box out, you have to do all that stuff. It's all, it's all the same. <laughs> It is hash, but a smarter hash. It's learned. It's a model as opposed to a function. Okay. Models are ultimately a function. Yes, it is. It is more complicated. Okay. So, from a performance standpoint, okay, how what difference did it really give from a performance standpoint from using a learned index compared to a B tree? Seventy percentage improvement in performance. That's what we are talking about, right? You can actually see the numbers here. So, B tree. It took like 280 nanoseconds to execute with a page size of 16, right? Uh, you can see that 98 nanoseconds. So you are getting a lot of performance uh, <coughs> improvement right there. Minus 63 or I mean, 63 percentage, whatever that is, right? So uh, 70 percentage on an average, that's what they really got uh, from a performance improvement standpoint. That's a huge deal. Right, when it comes to, and these things tend to improve. And that particular thing was actually run on a CPU. The, the benchmark was run on a CPU. Since it's not really fair, right? When you go for a, a race, if one person drives a Tesla, another person drives a Prius, it's not a fair race, right? So they wanted to make it fair. <laughs> okay. I used to drive both. That's where I got the analogy from, right? <laughs> but you're making your Tesla to drive like Prius now. So. <laughs> Uh, uh, Malay, the thinking of practical uses. So one of the things is we were talking about nanosecond, and that's that's where it struck me that okay, we are, here we are talking about getting it from 280 to 98 nanosecond. Yeah, we have, have an sure all of you, right? We've seen jobs run overnight. Sometimes they run two days. Right? <laughs> it's a problem. <laughs> so. And the customer said, hey, can you get it down by one hour? And he said, oh man, I have to work like, I don't know, I have to figure out, it's like a, uh, I have to be a rocket scientist to figure that out. The question is, that is, is there a practical application? Not yet, right? This is a research, it's ex and he said like, the, the paper is only one month old, okay? So it's extremely <laughs> research oriented yet. So uh, we haven't seen an application for it yet. No, uh, what I mean is not, not particularly yes. the, the index. I'm saying uh, deep learning and deep learning play a role. Yeah, this is this is actually deep learning. This can actually play a role, right? Yes. We just have to write it from scratch ourselves. Yeah. If you can actually write it from a retrieval perspective, yes, there's like a lot more work to be done on that particular uh, 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 side. But if you can do that, yes, a lot of those jobs <laughs> what you're talking about from data retrieval perspective, I mean, can be done. I mean, think of this way, right? If I can optimize all these stuff from a data access perspective, where things are stored, I can get it. In a really fast way, around this thing. Do we need Hadoop? It's a question we need to ask. Right? In computing in general, 95% of all computing happens on B trees right now. So it's just like a huge computation again. Retrieval, yeah. Retrieval. Uh, retrieval in general. And it will, the retrieval is just direct application, so there will be many indirect applications that will come out of it once you can retrieve information. Yes. Yes. So just one, one comment, and I, I don't know if this really will translate that way or not, but one way to think about it is that anything we want to find. We convert it into a key, look through the key, find the real record and bring it back. Then if we want more complex stuff to be found, what we do is we break it down into multiple keys, break it down into multiple searches. Maybe this will be capable of finding a more complex object. That is a uh, second so, index. Right. Uh, so, so instead of having uh, two attribute composite index, three attribute, five attribute, 10 attribute, now I can maybe deal with 80, 90, 100 attributes, 200 attributes. And, and actually find, find what I'm looking what for, uh, as as opposed to being limited to uh, <coughs> just the keys I can search. You're spot on. That was one of the uh, that's one of the things what they have said. Like uh, where it'll be a huge application. They haven't uh, pushed much out on it yet, but it's open to such area. It's Maybe we can push a paper out on that. It's it's a it's very like interesting. Almost uh, like a like a very complex search you can do. It yes. In yes. Now I'm going to probably nominate two guys from this room to push a paper out on it. Jeff and Pratik. <laughs> so you heard it, right? Two months. Okay. So we talked about all these things, right? Um, now, how does it handle insert and update? So there's a bounded cost for insert and update in case of a B tree. And you know what we're going to get. Yeah, we need to like you know um, rebalance the tree. Like you now we have to deal with all these things. But how does it happen in case of a model, neural network model, the deep learning model, right? So 
it may look as if uh, it's a uh, uh, the Achilles heel, right? But let's dig down even further on that. Um, there are two types of inserts. There's upper and an insert. Okay. Uh, let's take an example, right? I'm a customer. I'm going to Amazon. Probably I'm looking for a MacBook. Okay. The next book that I'm going to look for is something going to be similar to that. There's a learned pattern on that already, right? Uh, uh, if I look at it from that perspective, if my model learned that particular pattern very well, it can actually point to the right record already. Okay. Uh, so in that particular case, it becomes a big go of one operation, right? But they have actually digged it even further. Um, what if, I mean, like, you know, the model generalizes fairly well. What is the trade off from a last mile accuracy perspective? Let's say my model gives 99 percentage accuracy. That means when a new insert comes in, which is little different, can that particular pattern be learned? Or should I deal with something uh, later? So that's something which you need to worry about. And can it learn distribution changes? You know what? I'm not ordering a math book. I'm going to order a book for, let's say, cooking. I don't know when was the last time I cooked, but uh, I'm going to order a book for cooking. Okay, and just to surprise my wife, uh, this goes on YouTube. Tajish. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So when when I do something of the nature, can that distribution change or that pattern change? Can it be learned? But that, that's something which we have to deal with, right? Um, but what are the other approaches that we can actually uh, use to deal with such a problem? Is actually use something called as a delta index, right? Any new insert that comes in, let's keep it separate. It's an overnight process, a bad job which runs, right? Keep it separate. Till that point, you have to hit that particular. If you don't get accuracy here, you go and, and hit that particular thing to actually retrieve the data. But overnight, you rebalance or like you retrain the model with that particular data too. That is a way to go about uh, uh, thing. That's what they are uh, doing. So, and even the retraining, right? If you look at a CPU based retraining, that is uh, uh, hard, right? But if you actually start looking at a GPU or TPU based retraining, it's not that hard. Anyway, actually, you rebalance your index, I don't know, maybe fortnightly. Yeah. That's what they, they do. Uh, there are uh, the rebuild index uh, uh, scripts that are being run by DBAs uh, every now and then. Uh, if there is a high volume insert that goes in, they re generally rerun and rebuild the index or use the faster performance. Um, Actually, it depends. Uh, uh, what we have not talked about are the histograms. So there is a statistic stuff within a V plus three. So you are maintaining the index all the time. Unless you're doing a mass, mass insert, you can suspend the index and rebuild it. But it's about rebuilding the statistics yes. that they do on a periodic basis. So, so it's the, almost equal to the statistic. Way. So the, the, that's what they use, right? Uh, it goes to the histogram to even decide whether to use an index or not. Yes. Right? Whether they have to go for a full table scan or should I use an index scan? That decision is made by the, the, uh, the histogram, right? Now we are actually replacing that 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 entire thing from a data retrieval perspective. It's fairly uh, powerful. Okay. Okay, so I talked about I don't have I didn't have time to uh, finish my decks completely to take my my deck completely today. So <laughs> we talked about uh, uh, learn index, right? It actually works fairly well for integers, but for strings, for string data like name and other things, right? What we're dealing with, it doesn't give a good performance. So there are some obvious research areas that they are uh, future work that's going to be done on that particular uh, area. Okay, so strings. So let's take this one, right? We talked about regression, B tree, and all those things. But there are hash index. There is um, Bloom filter. Okay. So how can can that be optimized? That's something which you can think about. But the optimization in case of a hash index is not usually for performance. When hash is already gives a better performance, right? Uh, except the fact that you can actually deal with collisions uh, in that particular thing. But hash uh, can the hash performance be improved? Well, performance is probably not much. Right, I mean, like, no, I think hash would perform. Actually, hash performs a lot better than uh, a learned index and performance. But from a memory footprint uh, perspective, actually, learned index better performs a lot better than a hash uh, uh, index. Same case with Bloom filter. When you look at Bloom filter, Bloom filter can be thought of thought of about a classification uh, problem. What is Bloom filter? I mean, people know Bloom, what Bloom filter is. No. Okay, so let me be fairly accurate on Bloom filter. I get confused about uh, the false positives and false negatives. Okay, Bloom filters can actually have a, a false positive, right? Uh, for a data that uh, does not exist, it can tell, uh, 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 it can exist on one perspective, but it cannot have a false negative. So when you look at it, this is a classification thing, 
it's like you know whether it's going to rain tomorrow or not it's already pretty optimal from a performance standpoint and what it does it keeps just changing the grids uh, uh, in in bloom filter but uh, can the improvement be can can we bring any sort of performance improvement on probably no not from a, a execution standpoint but from a memory memory standpoint yes we can bring a little bit of uh, performance but they did put like another topic out there saying in case of group filter you generally go after only one particular uh, field or, or whatever right uh, but if your point is to find out whether a particular record exists or not a new network or deep learning can actually learn it with far more uh, uh, fields as Raji was saying like from an index perspective I can have like more attributes to learn rather than just one as a key so would that be effective to solve that particular problem probably yes so performance the execution standpoint performance for hash and um, um, uh, a blue filter was not that great, but from an, uh, this perspective, it was actually pretty good. Uh, from a memory footprint standpoint, it was very good. So that's where it is, right? It's, it's still like really, really research uh, uh, area. Uh, it's not put into production uh, anywhere yet so far. Uh, that's what I believe. That's what the paper is also saying. Um, but this is something like you, know, you you go for and Google for learn index, like and check in Reddit, all those things. There's so much chatter around it. This this paper is actually similar. Uh, in that perspective, if it, this, this idea takes off, the information retrieval process using B tree, which has been what for ages. I mean, like you know, I graduated in 2004, so 13 years. I studied that in 2000. I think this particular topic has been the same way for information retrieval from 70s. I, I wrote a program on that in 91, so <laughs> it's, it's way before that. 70s, right? So things haven't evolved for 40 or 50, 60 years. Now we are actually looking at changing that particular thing for faster retrieval. So it, it can be like you know a big thing. Watch out for it. Yeah. Any questions? Can you go to the back to the performance slide? So here you are saying size saving. So a uh, little bit, right? B three obviously has a huge size. Uh, you have to load. No, it's still it's a memory structure, right? You have to load. With the neural network, you just learn weights. The weights are thirty-two uh, neurons or whatever. So that's what it is. That's the difference. Yes, the difference. In a layer, the weights, the architecture, and so on. Uh, is any question on the phone? Guys were remote. Probably those stuff. Are they muted? Yeah, they muted. Are the questions which we need to answer? No, no questions, Malai. Okay. Okay. So those of you who have run a lot of time in explain explain plan, this will throw that out to you basically. Because okay. explain plan fundamentally you can explain. This won't need to and will not actually explain why. It'll just tell you that that record is likely to be there. Not why. But the explain plan actually goes through that whole step. This kind of cuts through that and says this is where. Yeah, so that's what I really had. You know, usually not in a hard enough presentation. It's a fairly short one. It's a research paper. So, how does the learning work? Does learning, can also learning be based on you know, retrieving these kind of information. So yeah, you know, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's the reason for recursive model index, right? You can actually tune a particular model for faster mm -hmm. That's why I said like, it has to be the, uh, the obvious patterns in data for as a consideration, right? When you do that. But in case of V3, we always go for uh, the worst case performance. So that's where the difference comes in, really. I mean, let's say most of your is coming from active let's say Google knows. Okay. Thanks, thanks. Uh, I think